Good morning. I just invite you to pay attention to where the morning has brought you so far. There has been such beautiful worship and I sat um, behind the stage and just listened to the singing and it was lovely. So I invite you to pay attention to where the music and the prayers have brought your heart this morning as we dive into another prophet, Habakkuk. Our current sermon series is witnessing the end, the withering, the ashes of an old covenant. And these prophets have been preaching for decades, for years, saying, turn, turn back to God. So <clears throat> how many of you are fire builders when you go camping? Hands up, any fire builders? Any successful one-match fire builders in the house? Yes, we have some successful one-match fire builders. I do love camping. I love everything about camping. I love building fires, and I love watching the flames lick upward and catch the birch bark, birch bark or the bits of tinder and kindling, and then slowly they catch more. We, we camped in uh, very soggy weather in Clear Lake, and we had to fight hard. There were no one-notch fires. We had to fight very hard to get those fires going. When the evening is done, if you've timed it right, the logs have disintegrated to a pile of ash, occasional tongues of fire kind of exploring the bit of not quite burned wood before flickering out. That's when this series is taking place, these prophets. They're living in a time when the covenant has begun to flicker and fade. And not because God has not been faithful. You can Netflix your way through these minor prophets, bringing them on, binging on them all, listening to them. They range from one to seven, maybe a few more chapters each. And Habakkuk, where we find ourselves today, takes place in the final decades of Israel's southern kingdom. Israel is gonna fall. Judah is gonna fall. But Habakkuk's message is not anymore to the people. The prophets have been talking to the people. They've been asking them to turn. Habakkuk is talking to God. So Habakkuk starts with lament, and there's this back and forth conversation between Habakkuk and God about God's choice of ways to bring judgment. And then, so if you take a look at one of the papers that have it, there's one column that talks about the conversation between Habakkuk and God. And then in the middle, chapter two, there's these five woes of judgment. And then chapter three, so I'm going the wrong way for you, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. Chapter three is a prayer, Habakkuk's prayer that's framed as a psalm. It's a congregational song, and it in, he includes uh, directions for music, full orchestra, um, and so there's lament, there's woes, and there's a prayer. And strewn along the way, especially in chapter two, that you, we find some gems that might be familiar to us, phrases that the New Testament writers and today's church have held onto, have used as significant faith anchors throughout the, age, um, the ages. Okay, so obviously I have camping on the brain. My second camping question, if you're going into cold water, do you wade in slowly or do you dive in off the deep end? How many wade in slowly people do we have here? Okay, how many are just gonna dive in off the deep end? All right, okay. <clears throat> Today we're diving in off the deep end. Habakkuk begins in the middle of disaster. Are you ready? God, how long do I have to cry out for help before you listen? How many times do I have to yell help, murder, police before you come to the rescue? Why do you force me to look at evil, stare trouble in the face day after day? Anarchy and violence break out, quarrels and fights all over the place, law and order fall to pieces, justice is a joke. The witness have the righteous hamstrung and they stand justice on its head. Thanks, Habakkuk. He dives into the deep end. Now maybe your summer has been quiet and peaceful and a gift. Maybe your summer has been a crazy one and you've come to church for some solace. Thanks Lakeview for constantly dousing us into the deep end of these prophetic rants and ravings. 
but I hope that as you listen to Habakkuk's ranting and lamenting that you are also finding this seeking, tireless God who will move heaven and earth to reach his people. So I want to point out that Habakkuk's lament uh, lament doesn't actually change a whole lot. His cry for help and for justice does not bring God to the rescue, unlike, and I just keep, this is one thing as I've thought about Habakkuk and Micah and all these prophets, Jonah, the guy who runs away when God calls him, is the only one who really had any success. This is very interesting to me. Habakkuk really doesn't change anything in his lament. They don't seem to bring anyone to repentance, doesn't really cause God to come to the rescue. So I want to spend a bit of time this morning on lament. What is lament? I think that lament is standing before God and being honest with God. He knows what we're thinking before we even say anything, but there's something about saying to God, there's this thing that's happening. There's this thing that I'm feeling and I need you to know what's going on. The Psalms are full of lament. Even the New Testament carries lament. Jesus on the cross says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Echoing David, Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? King David said this. There's precedent for asking God hard questions. In the Gospel of John, both Mary and Martha say to Jesus when their brother died, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's a, it's a way of lamenting. And it's a way of calling God to account for his actions or his lack of them. And if prayers of intercession and pleading happen before a disaster, lament is what happens after. Mary and Martha were no longer looking for their brother to be healed, had no idea there would be a resurrection. They are lamenting. King David laments the silence of God. Habakkuk is lamenting God's delay in rescue and in bringing justice. So much is going wrong and God is not intervening. So when we lament, lament reveals our understanding of the world. And when we lament, it also reveals our understanding or our relationship with God. Lament reveals our hopes and our dreams for our lives, for our families, for our work, for our nation. And as I've, uh, as I've been reading Habakkuk for the last few weeks, one of my own prayers of lament came to, came to mind from long ago. And I share this because I've been reminded in such a concrete way, this week in our parking lot, in the Lakeview parking lot, I had a conversation. And it was like God was bringing me right back to that prayer of lament, reminding me that God's ways are not my ways. His thoughts are not my thoughts. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than ours and his thoughts than ours. And I think that God engages in our lives partly through the doorways of our lament. They're doorways for him. So more than 30 years ago, um, my husband, my first husband had passed away in a plane crash suddenly. And a prayer that I prayed while I was on my bed, it just came back to me this last week and it was, I said to God, if you have anything else for me, like if you have any other disasters for me, could you do it now? Like, could you, like, I was on my bed, I was having a hard time getting up in the morning, didn't know how to put one foot in front of the other. And I just thought, I'm gonna hold you to account for this. I don't know, actually, and I'm sorry, this is not gonna be theologically correct, but that's the whole thing about lament, you get to say what you wanna say. I'm like, God, were you sleeping? Were you paying attention to somebody else's big trouble somewhere that you didn't notice what was going on with this plane? Like, what was going on that you couldn't just reach out and just let that plane land? What was going on? Was that my lament? It was certainly anger. 
And as I have a wonderful home church, Randy and I do, and as we've sat together in our home church over the years, um, and I've heard many different ways that dear people have prayed during loss, have lamented. There are many different ways that we hold God accountable for what he is doing in this world. And the Bible's not afraid to hold God accountable for the events of the world. We have to believe that God could rescue, right? We have to believe that God is able to make change. He is the almighty God. He is the God who creates by just speaking a word and light happens. He's the God who redeems. He's the God who is from everlasting to everlasting. So we have to be able to ask him about things when they go wrong. And that is the point of lament. Because somehow in this world that we exist in, in a world that's riddled with evil and judgment and brokenness, at the same time, we have this loving creator who is pulling us forward on the tales of grace towards renewal and restoration and redemption. All those words that try to describe a word and a life made right. And lament is a way of holding on to God in the midst of evil. Because if you let go, if you pretend that evil's not evil, or if you dismiss it as not really hurtful, or if you're too quick to say, it's okay, God works all things for good. We know that he does, but oh, it's excruciating. Or to decide to exist in a chaotic world with evil and let go of this covenant-making God, either way, it leads us to a free fall. So I just invite you to, to ask yourself, where do you need to lament this morning? Where is God disappointing you, not showing up, not rescuing, allowing your life to take unexpected turns and tossing you out of a safe and predictable life? Is it health? Is it a relationship that is betraying you? Is it work that is breaking you? Where do you need to lament this morning? Lament may actually precede our readiness to engage again in new ways. Lament may precede our readiness to trust God again, because sometimes when things happen, we just walk away, we say, uh, I'm done with you, God. I, I don't know how to believe in a God who does this. So, Lament keeps us hanging on, and often God responds to our lament in very unexpected ways. He, he may not respond face on to say, well, let me tell you, Darlene, this is what I'm gonna do. He doesn't always do that. He kind of comes around by the side, right? <clears throat> so, I'm gonna tell you what God's response to Habakkuk was, once again, diving into the deep end. Look around at the godless nations, look long and hard, Brace yourself for a shock because something's about to take place and you're going to find it hard to believe. I am about to raise up the Babylonians to punish you. So Habakkuk begins with lament and God responds with something like, you haven't seen anything yet, Habakkuk. And Habakkuk responds with a challenge. He says, Lord, are you not from everlasting to everlasting? You are the Holy One, you will never die. God, you chose the Babylonians for your judgment work? Rock solid God, you gave them the job of discipline? But you can't be serious. You can't condone evil. So why don't you do something about this? Why are you silent? Why are you silent now? This is outrage. Evil men swallow up the righteous and you stand around and watch. Like Habakkuk, he's just kind of, he's, he's on a rant. So then he goes on, he says, you're treating men and women as so many fish in the ocean, swimming without direction, swimming but not getting anywhere. Then this evil Babylonian arrives and goes fishing. He pulls in a good catch. Habakkuk's in camping mode as well. He catches his limit and fills his bucket. It's a good day of fishing. He's happy. He praises his rod and reel, piles his fishing gear on an altar and worships it. It's made his day and he's going to eat well tonight. Are you going to let this go on and on? Habakkuk says to God. 
I don't know about you, but I think I want Habakkuk in my corner. This prophet's prayers are fearless. And if you ever wonder if your prayers are a bit bold, a little shocking to God, a little out of line, pay attention to these prayers recorded in Scripture. They are real. They are real longings, frustrations, wrestling with our covenant-making, creating, halfway through the wilderness shaping, come down to earth to be one of us, kind of God. Don't be afraid to be real when you pray. And after his bold confrontation with God, Habakkuk sits back to see how God will respond. Actually, he doesn't sit back. He actually climbs to a lookout tower to wait. And I don't know, does he feel like he's maybe overstepped? I, I'm not sure, but it says, what is God gonna say to my questions? I'm braced for the work. First, I'm going to climb to the lookout tower and I'm going to scan the horizon and I'll wait. I'm going to wait to see what God says, see how he's going to answer my complaint. So God's response in chapter 2, while Habakkuk waits on the watchtower, is a fairly strong blast of oracles and he tells him to write this large so anybody running by can see the message. But he's got five, five oracles, five woes, warnings of judgment. Woe to him who piles up stolen goods. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gains. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed. Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbors till they're drunk. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life. And in the midst of these judgments, which we may have become a little numb to in these weeks in the prophets, Habakkuk embeds three amazing little phrases that have reverberated through the New Testament. The first one is in chapter 2, verse 4. It says, see, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not right, but the righteous person will live by their faithfulness. Do you hear it? This little phrase is taken by Paul in the New Testament to highlight a defining reality that we live by faith rather than works in Romans. It, it began in Habakkuk. Romans 1.17, for the go- in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. And in Galatians 3, verse 11, this little phrase was instrumental in converting Martin Luther in the 1500s and beginning the entire Reformation. And then in Hebrews 10, it says, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. Before a camping trip this July, I stopped at Cabela's, and I bought a large ninja slack line from the shelf. It was the last one. I've been looking uh, for something like this for a while. What you do is you take the straps and you wind, you wind them around a stable anchor, maybe a tree, um, and it can carry the weight of people who walk. These slack lines, if you put them down on the ground, you just kind of walk and try to get your balance. If the, the ninja ones, you put a little bit higher so that the kids can, can, um, can use their arm strength and go from one to another. It's a mobile slack line. It works really great. So at Clear Lake, we found a few fantastic trees, and we had these set up in our camp spots. They were great for the kids, and even some adults were playing on the slack lines as well. So when we came home, my intention was that I was going to put that ninja line in in my backyard for the grandkids. So we looped one end of the ninja line around our good old poplar and extended across the trampoline. That seems like a good idea, right? <clears throat> and attached it to the post of our good old treehouse. Well, I did not even consider the possibility that laws of physics already in place would render my plans rather ineffective. As soon as the kids started testing the line, the treehouse started dancing. It was like rearing up, and it's like, oh no, this is not going to work. This anchor is not going to hold. I stare at my yard pretty often to try to come up with plan B. I think I have a plan. Stay tuned. So a slack line is not a complete picture of living by faith, but 
It is a glimpse of what it means to put your anchor onto something that will hold. And the Bible gives us a sense, and Habakkuk gives us a sense too, that anchoring our lives to God and God's long-term, long-range purposes is a reliable anchor. And it is the anchor that the prophets are begging us to hold on to. It's this covenant-making God. Not our own strength, not our own schemes and fishnets, even though we don't see the effects in our immediate circumstances. And as you read Habakkuk, can you feel the tautness of the lines? He's stretching and he's testing the lines that are anchored. And Habakkuk is not holding out the hope that having enough faith is gonna avert the disaster. Do you hear that? Habakkuk's prophecy held no hope out for the repentance of the people that was gonna avert the disaster. Although we do know that repentance will always change the heart of God. But Habakkuk is not asking for that. The faith of the righteous was throwing out a lifeline beyond what they understood of God. And I think that this phrase reverberates through our history. It reverberates through scripture and reverberates through our own lives. It takes us through the disaster where we wake up in our bed and we cannot wake up and we cannot, we cannot put one foot into another the anchor doesn't seem to hold, but Habakkuk says this anchor holds. It holds. We cannot take this phrase living by faith as a weapon. We cannot say have more faith and then things will be okay. That is not what Habakkuk is saying. Living by faith that the lines will hold does not guarantee that there will not be disaster but oh, it helps us to hang on to a God who is from everlasting to everlasting. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. As it, this, is another, this is the second gem that happens in the middle of the oracle. God is talking about the disaster that is gonna come also to the Babylonians because he's gonna take them down as well. But he, but while evil is all we see, while the evil is what we hear in the news, underneath it all, there's something else happen. The water levels are rising. And the water levels that are rising are not of evil. The water levels that are rising are of the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. That's the second gem. The final gem from Habakkuk 2 is inscribed on many church sanctuaries just over the door, just before you come in. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. I remember that in several of the churches that I grew up in, and often I thought that that was a way to remind me that I needed to be quiet in church. No talking. <clears throat> Habakkuk's use of words suggests that he's not actually talking about at the earthly temple. He's talking about the heavenly temple of God, of which any buildings or temples down here are just smoke and mirrors. The Lord is enthroned in the heavens. The anchor holds to the end of time. So stop trying to call your weak idols to help you. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. So as lament happens, and as an encounter with God can do, Habakkuk's prayers are changed. And as we move towards the Lord's Supper, I invite you into Habakkuk's prayer from chapter three. Habakkuk has courage to move from lament to request, so now he says, God, I've heard what our ancestors say about you and I'm stopped in my tracks, I'm down on my knees, please do among us what you did among them. Work among us as you worked among them, and as you bring judgment, as you surely must, remember, remember mercy. Though the cherry trees don't blossom, and the strawberries don't ripen, 
Though the apples are worm-eaten and the wheat fields are stunted, though the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns are empty, I am singing joyful praise to God, Habakkuk says. I'm turning cartwheels of joy to God my Savior. Counting on God's rule to prevail, I take heart and I gain strength. I run like a deer. I feel like I'm king of the mountain. For congregational use, with full orchestra. Sometimes we can pray these prayers. Sometimes we need to be with the people of God together to learn how to pray these prayers together. If the words of praise feel a bit like gravel in your mouth this morning, you're not quite ready to pray this psalm. If you still are in lament, we honor that. You are invited to watch and wait the way Habakkuk did for our God to respond. And we come together to the table of Jesus who invites us to bring our whole selves, our fractured selves, whatever we are, whoever we are, we are invited to the table. Throw your line, throw your lines around the anchors that will hold from everlasting to everlasting. He is God. Mm -hmm.